This is Sharon Terry. I'm president uh, and CEO of PXE International and also of an uh, umbrella group called Genetic Alliance, which I'll talk about a little as well. Uh, this program, which we've named Health Engagement and Lifestyle Program, HELP, which is a nice quick acronym, um, is going to be a program that we're going to roll out over the next couple of years, the first phase of which is a survey. Um, we are um, uh, very interested in uh, today showing you how this fits into the kind of global picture, and I do mean global, as well as giving you an idea of what the, um, what the survey itself does. Okay. So for the first um, piece, I want to talk about why we're doing this. So we want to understand PXE better. We kn we've known for a very long time that everybody has a different uh, experience of PXE, that even siblings have a different experience. And in a few cases where we have identical twins, they have a different experience. So every experience is really critical to understanding the disease. We're going to talk in a second about elephants and the worldview of New York City that may seem irrelevant, but it's quite relevant. Uh, and also, we're going to collect data in addition to stories. So we've, for years now, had lots of stories coming into us through various social media, especially lately Facebook, a thousand people sharing their stories. And now we really want to turn that information into data. And it's important that we do that. So my uh, reference to the elephant is this, for those of you who are able to see this. And again, I apologize for those who have low vision. I will keep trying to explain what is on the slides. And here's the classic cartoon. Uh, I think it actually came from a Chinese proverb initially, essentially said that if a, a, a group of people uh, who are blindfolded uh, looked at an elephant, they would find it to be very different. It's a snake, it's a tree, it's a spear, it's a fan, it's a wall, it's a rope, depending on what part of the elephant they saw. And we know that none of their opinions or their perceptions are correct, that we really need all of them together to understand what it is they're, um, they're looking at. Likewise, there's this old New Yorker cartoon, which is now up on your screen. Again, a little fuzzy because it is a very old cartoon, 1976, before things were really digital. And essentially, this is a view of the world uh, the, via what a New Yorker thinks of. So for those of you not from the US, my apologies for you using a US analogy, but essentially everyone's heard of New York. Everyone knows New Yorkers think it's the whole world. And in this picture, you're seeing New York. The city is huge. The Hudson River is a little bit smaller. Jersey is a kind of tiny sliver. And then way out there, we're looking at Utah and Los Angeles. And then there's the Pacific Ocean, and there's a few countries on the other side not much um, interest on the part of the New Yorkers to see beyond just New York. If we characterize the whole world by just what we saw in New York, we would not understand the whole world. And so just like that, we're really trying to understand PXE better. We're also trying to su pr provide support for a healthy lifestyle. And that piece will roll out over the next year or so. We have applied for a grant uh, to look at healthy lifestyle. You remember that we did try a small pilot program about a year ago. Uh, in which we had people work on moving more, eating better, et cetera, and we're, we're going to amplify on that uh, with the understanding that if we can start to understand PXE overall and its manifestations and how it's progressing, then in fact we're going to have a better understanding also of how we might uh, mitigate or solve some of the problems associated with it. And then finally, we're looking to do targeted research and therapy development. And we have some very good breakthroughs. In fact, today we have a webinar only uh, two hours from now uh, on one of those breakthroughs. And those are going to require that we understand PXE better. We're going to need something called biomarkers, things that we can measure for sure that will show us whether or not a therapy is working. Uh, right now we could say, well, you know, kind of their, that person's skin looks better. Looks better is not a very good scientific measure. And we could say, we think that their vision is stabilizing. Well, sometimes it stabilizes anyway. So was it the treatment, or was it the intervention, or was it just because? So basically what we want to do uh, is figure out how to make all of that more scientific um, as we go. I'm showing you here a slide, uh, again, for those with low vision, it, it says IRDIC on it, I-R-D-I-R-C. That's the International Rare Disease Research Consortium. And on it, you can see it's showing some of the rare disease activities in Europe. It has a bit about the NIH uh, genomic data sharing policy. 
It also shows a kind of thermometer on the right-hand side that is um, uh, how many drugs have been developed since we began this project in 2010. I'm on the steering committee for this project, and essentially the uh, project is allowing uh, us to work together globally on rare diseases. PXE is a rare disease, and so it has a home in this International Rare Disease Research Consortium, which is quite supportive of things like we are launching uh, today uh, with this HELP program. We're uh, very much involved in it. Again, I have a seat on the steering committee, so I'm uh, very active in it. I just came back from China where we held our executive committee meeting and also some other meetings around rare diseases, and that gives us a global context. We also have a U.S. context, and the U.S. context is launching this in the context of something called PCORnet. And PCORnet is the National Patient-Centered Clinical Research Network that the U.S. has decided to um, engage in. It is taking 2% of the Medicaid budget of the U.S. And, and spending it on programs like ours. So PXE International has received funding from this program through Genetic Alliance, which is the other organization that I run. Nine different groups have received funding together. Um, uh, 18, sorry, there's 18 uh, groups uh, that have received funding, and you can see some of them here, and you can see some of the diseases are rare, and some of them are common. And if you look partway down this slide where I've highlighted it in black with white writing and bolded pseudoxanthoma elasticum, you can see the nine diseases under the Genetic Alliance Project. The Genetic Alliance Project is called CENA, which means Community Engaged Network for All. So, so far I've described that we are part of an international effort called the International Rare Disease Research Consortium. We're part of a U.S. national effort called uh, PCORnet and a specific project within PCORnet with the diseases that you see on the screen. Again, I'll read them. Alstrom syndrome, axis, which is X and Y chromosome anomalies, dyskeratosis congenita, breast cancer, hepatitis, Joubert, MLD, which is a leukodystrophy, Gaucher, and PXE. We're working together with these other organizations on a platform like I'm going to show you uh, in order that we understand each of these diseases better. But obviously, today, we're most interested in PXE. So we begin with a premise uh, that says everybody has a different view about privacy. When uh, our first surveys were done over the last 19 years, we pretty much said PXC International will be in charge of deciding where your data goes. We live in a much more well-connected world, and we have lots more resources at our fingertips in order to make it easier for us to decide where our data should be used. And in this study that's on your screen, we're showing a study done in uh, 2009 by the Institute of Medicine essentially showed that 1.5% of the population thought it was okay for researchers to use data without any consent from the individual who owns the health data, and 16.5% would not want researchers to contact or use data under any circumstances. Those are the extremes. So in this green area, well, and actually, I'll, I'll do the progression here. In this red area, we have Michael J. Fox when he was still filming Back to the Future and other kinds of things on TV. I forgot what television show he was on. Um, he didn't want anybody to know he had uh, Parkinson's disease. Then flash forward to a few years ago when he established the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's disease. Now he's on TV, he's on uh, public uh, uh, social media, et cetera advertising that he has the disease, so he's down here on the green end of the spectrum. What we find is most people wind up somewhere along this continuum, probably not at the red or the green, but somewhere in between. And in this study, they noted that most people were somewhere around this yellow, which is, I would like to have my data used for studies, but I'd like to be contacted in advance. So the system that we've created allows that kind of granularity around who gets your data. I will say before I continue that lots of people with conditions for which they wish there was a solution wind up in this green area, very eager to share their data. But we also know that it might be that you want to share your PXE data, but for example, if you have uh, another issue that you don't want to share, it might be back in this yellow area. So we're really giving people the opportunity to decide what's shared and when, and I'll show you that specifically. So the tool we're using is called Platform for Engaging Everyone Responsibly, nicknamed PEER. 
And I'm sorry about all the names I'm throwing at you today, which is partly why we're recording this. Um, we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to hear this again if you need to. Um, and most of this you don't need to remember, whether it's Sina, which is the project, or Peer, which is the platform. And this is an example of a privacy setting pl uh, uh, dashboard. And it's a generic one, because we're doing this for lots of diseases on the genetic alliance level. Uh, I will show you in a moment the PXE one. So under support groups here, you can see it says XYZ Foundation. Under medical researchers, it says researchers studying XYZ. Uh, so those are sort of fill in the blanks on a macro level. And what it allows, is, and I'll show you again this quite clearly, um, it allows people to discover your information anonymously, allows, and I'm saying people, but I mean researchers, to export and use your data uh, anonymously, and allows you to be contacted for actual research studies. And you can say allow, ask me, or deny, and you can edit these quite easily at any time. And I'm actually going to go through all that and show you what that looks like. So here again, this is just a slide. We'll go to this live. But here are the guides to help you, because what I just showed you could be pretty complicated. We've decided that we would like to give people guides. The guides have underneath their picture uh, dots, and the dots have a check mark in one of them. The dots represent that curve I just showed from I don't want to share anything over here in the red to I'd like to share a lot over here in the green. You can see that Dean, who's a guide for us, is a little bit in the green. You can see that Prentice is in the yellow, and Jessica's in the yellow. You can select them as your guide. You can also see that they've set up three different levels of sharing, and I'll show you that live in just a minute. In addition, the other thing that we're really excited about is the survey is what's called gamified. And for you, that means you can get back actual feedback on what does your sign or symptom look like up against everyone else. And the examples I gave here uh, is, a, is a continuum, I feel well informed about my health, not at all, and extremely. And if I chose this red dot right here, I can see that 61% of people uh, felt not at all compared to where I am, and 39% were uh, feeling more informed than I am. Or one or both of my parents smoked in the house during my childhood or adolescence. If I say always, in this case, 26% of the respondents said always, 48% said never. So, and these are not the questions you'll be answering for PXE. Your questions are more PXE specific. These are generic ones. But you get the idea that you can get feedback on this question uh, right away by answering it. So now let's go to the actual site, which is always a dangerous thing to do during the webinar. OK, so we are at the PXE homepage. And this portal here is the same one that all the nine groups are using, and actually quite a number of other groups. So there's about 25 different diseases already on this portal. Uh, the portal sits as an iframe right in the PXE International website. You can see this fabulous looking website that we've recently rewritten and recreated, both because we had malicious code attack our website, as well as the fact that we needed a, a refreshing and a new look. Uh, thanks a lot to Ian Terry and Terry McDermade for putting this together. You may still, when you're in here, stumble on pages that are not up yet. Uh, but that's because we're trying to move about 2,000 pages by rewriting them. In any case, here's the portal. And the portal comes in through an iframe. So it's essentially part of our web page. Here's some more stuff that's just on our web page about today's webinar. And then here, again, is the top of the web page. So when you go to the home page, you're looking in the middle. And if you've been watching here, you can see uh, this image changes because we have um, a series of videos uh, from individuals who are guides uh, to invite us, essentially, to uh, the site. And so you could click on one of these and listen to them. This one is Jessica Harper. My name is Jessica Harper, and I have pseudoxanthelma elasticum, also known as PXE. So when I was about 11 years old, my mother noticed a patch of skin on my neck that was kind of lumpy, kind of like chicken skin. So she took me to see a dermatologist who did a little biopsy, and he was very excited by the results because it indicated that I had a disease that was so rare that he'd almost never seen it before. I eat 
So I'm going to interrupt Jessica there. But you can look at any of these three, or you could just say Start Now. So I've just clicked Start Now, and I'm going to pretend that I am a new user. I'm going to have to remember what my new username is, though. OK, I got it. I have a new, I'm a new user, and I'm using my uh, email address, which is pxesurvey at gmail.com. And I'm entering that into the box that says, first time user, register here, sign up here. I'm going to click Sign Up. OK, now it says that a sign up code has been sent to me. So I'm going to go to my email. And you're going to do exactly this when you sign up. Just like signing up essentially for online banking or online bill paying of some kind. And I can see right here in my um, Gmail, private access confirmation code. So I'm going to open that. And it says, welcome. And it tells me a bit about this. Um, that, uh, for example, that a something called Western IRB, Western Institutional Review Board, has reviewed this platform that I'm about to use, that I could look at this written statement that WERB is requiring. And so here's a written statement saying uh, what, in fact, you'll be going through. It's the equivalent of an old-fashioned informed consent form. But I can stay here in my email and see, OK, to confirm that you've uh, considered this attached information statement and complete the sign-up process, copy and paste this code. So I see this code here. A5KJW2. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to come back to the site where I signed up, and I'm going to paste that in. You can also type that in if you want to. The t trouble with typing it, of course, is I might get it wrong, so I chose to paste it, but you can do either. And I'm going to submit that code. And then it brings me to a screen that asks me to create a username and a password. I'm going to call myself Demo Sharon 2, because I already actually have a demo. And I'm going to create a password and make sure my passwords match and click Continue. And it says, wow, your password doesn't work because it needs to be at least eight characters, one capital letter, one lowercase, and at least one number. So I'm going to go back and change, go again to um, the password screen. And I'm going to make a nice password that it likes. Let's see if I can match these passwords on the fly here. No, they don't match. I'm in that frustrating cycle we all go through. OK, now it's processing. OK. Now I'm in a screen. Again, looks a lot like the bank. I'm going to make it a little bigger, even though part of my my um, page will go my uh, page will go off the screen. And it's asking me for those challenge questions that I could set up and recognize. So, what was the color of your first car? Well, my parents gave me a Chevy Impala that was cream color. Uh, what town did you meet your significant other? I actually met Pat in Sharon, Connecticut. Uh, let's see, what street did you live on in the sixth grade? You guys are all going to be able to get into my bank accounts after this. Uh, Sylvan, Sylvan Avenue. And then I get to pick a picture that I think is a good one. Uh, I like this eagle, so I'm pick, picking that. And I can enter a caption uh, for it. This is um, an, uh, optional, but I did just put eagle there. All those things are just like if you use online banking. You want to make sure that everything is all set for just you and no one else can get in. OK, and then I'm going to uh, write in here my name. I'm calling myself Sharon Demo just for this. Um, I'm going to say I live in Washington, DC, which is where I am right now. I know this is a little tedious, but I really did want everybody to see how this goes. Did this ask me for DC? And then I say I'm at least 18 years old, and if I provide information for anyone other than myself, I have the legal right to represent them. So this is important for those of you who are doing this for a child or for a parent who is decisionally impaired, maybe has Alzheimer's or dementia of some kind. 
Or it's also possible that you will do this for someone who has such low vision they can't see it themselves. And the legal right in that case might be as simple as they're sitting next to you, uh, but we do want to make sure that you have the right to enter that information. So I'm going to say continue. Okay, now it says we'd like you to open and review this end user license agreement. And this user agreement, the lawyers wrote. So it says everything it's supposed to say about it's not charging you, it's, you're authorized to put the information in, um, how you can terminate the account, what happens if you die, all sorts of stuff um, that are important things uh, that we want to make sure you understand. However, most people I know don't read the EULAs on all these. We set up our iPhone or we go to Facebook and we don't read all this stuff. We would like you to read it um, and accept it, uh, but if you choose to believe us that it's there, then that's okay too. Uh, it is quite comprehensive and we keep iteratively improving it as we go. So it says, congratulations, you've successfully registered with private access. You saw before when I went to this email, it comes from private access. And this describes private access, as does the EULA, the user agreement. Private access is the company that Genetic Alliance is partnering with to, show, to uh, assure privacy. Uh, the actual software, which I won't get into, is 600,000 lines of code, $10 million investment, and has taken eight years to develop. We're going to simply press continue and enjoy the software rather than worrying about it. OK, so now I'm back at that page. I'm going to shrink this back down just for a moment so you can see it. You see, again, I'm still just right inside the PXC International website. And now it says I can select a guide. And again, I'll make these a little bigger so that we can all see them. And I could select Dean, or I could select Prentice, or I could select Jessica. And I think also, or I, I can also create my preferences manually. And again, I can say, what's this? And I get to that chart again to show, oh, here's, according to that chart, where Prentice decided her privacy preference lay or here, is, here are deans according to that chart. I could also do this manually. But I'm going to select Prentice as my guide. And I'm going to shrink this back down so you can see it again. There's a couple things on this page that are pretty important. So I see Prentice. I see Prentice suggested privacy concerns for people with low privacy concerns. I can choose moderate or I can choose high. And when I do that, this screen below here is going to change. So let's say I came in, I like Prentice's story, I listened to her video, but I really would much prefer moderate privacy concerns. So I can switch and a new panel comes up. Or I can go to her high privacy concerns and another panel will come up. OK. The other thing I can do is go back and select a different guide. And I can customize these if I don't quite like them. I could also just accept them and continue. And the other thing you'll want to watch is it says, you are currently viewing suggested privacy settings for Sharon. That's because, again, if I have a child under 18, or a child who's decisionally impaired, or an elder that's decisionally impaired, I can actually be viewing privacy settings for that person and set this up for that person. We'll go over that later. But now let's look at this dashboard. And it says, uh, PXC International, as an advocacy and support group, I'm going to allow them to discover my anonymous information. I'm going to ask them to ask me to export and use it. I'm going to ask them to contact me. Now I might say, well, really? Uh, they already know who I am. That's how I got this invitation. So I'm going to customize this screen. So I see now that I have actually little toggles. And I'm going to say, I'm going to allow PXC International to export and use my information. I can also click this for more details about that. And it will tell me what, what do these things mean. And I'm actually going to allow them to contact me, because they already do contact me. Now, if I had stumbled on this site and hadn't registered with them, I might say, ask me. And what will happen is I would get an email using a foreign key, meaning it didn't know who I am, except through this system where I'm only identified by the foreign key. Uh, it also will say uh, disease info search listed organizations serving my condition. And I can look if I want to at disease info search to see what I think of that. Turns out that's a site run by Genetic Alliance. It has 10,000 diseases and their subtypes in it. And I can look up my disease and see if there's other 
advocacy organizations supporting that disease. So I can certainly say allow. I might want to say ask me there because I don't know these organizations. And to be consistent, I would probably put ask me for contacting me. And then all con uh, organizations serving my condition, probably allow for me, allow here, and again ask me. Researchers recommended by PXC International, recommended by any disease info search org, addressing my condition or all, um, all conditions, um, all researchers, I can also set these up any way that I want to uh, so that they could contact me, etc. And so you can see uh, that I have a lot of, um, uh, a lot, uh, sorry, I'm distracted by a question. I'll answer in a second. I, you can see I have a lot of options here. What we're finding is 85% of people just accept it and go on. But again, you can play with these if you'd like. Uh, someone noted that in the slides that I had, um, this says for Pat. And that's because when I was setting up this demo, I decided to put my husband Pat in here, for whom I do not have legal right, by the way, because he's functional. Um, but I needed another name just to set up these privacy directives. And so yes, I could select a guide for a child, a guide for an elder, a guide for someone that I'm helping. Um, and that will be their own account. Uh, but what I'm trying to do uh, here right now is to look at what happens if I set this up for myself. So once I'm satisfied with this, and again, um, you can either accept what uh, the guide has recommended, and they've been over these, and they're pretty confident about them, uh, and go on, or you could play with them and change them yourself. So I'm going to say next. Now it's showing me a summary of what I did. And this is helpful because it might say, Oh, wait a minute, I might say, researchers addressing my condition, I have denied them from, from contacting me. Well, no, actually, I would really like them to contact me, and so I could actually then go back and fix that one because I want to be contacted. I want them to ask me. Um, I uh, may, though, in fact, decide, no, I don't want any contact from researchers. I, that's just how it is. I, I don't have any interest in, in researchers. So for the sake of time, I'm going to accept these and continue. Again, it's going to give me a confirmation of what um, I've accepted. I verify and continue now so that we can get an experience of the survey itself as well. Okay, and back to, again, we see for Sharon here, because that's the only person in this account, that's all I see. If I had set up, you know, let's pretend Ian and Elizabeth, my two children with PXE, were still under 18, it would say Elizabeth and Ian here. Let's say I also set it up for my mother, uh, Helen. She has Alzheimer's disease, and I'm her power of attorney. It could say Helen here. I wouldn't be filling out the PXE survey for her. I would be filling out the Alzheimer's survey for her. But right now, we're going to look at answering the survey, then doing some follow-up, and then ask for records. I click here to start, and I'm in the health survey. So this survey actually serves up the best question for you. Um, it takes between 60 minutes and 120 minutes. Um, in fact, we might want to change this screen to actually say that. Um, people who have been pretty quick through it um, have been taking about 60 minutes, but I've also noticed some people take an hour and a half or so. Uh, so you want to do it when you have some time or when you're fine about saving it and coming back to it, which you also can do. So then I begin, and I say I'm answering for myself as an affected individual or answering for someone else who's affected by PXE. I'm going to actually say I'm answering for myself. And you can see of the individuals who have answered so far, the survey's been live about three days. 85% say answering for myself as an affected individual. 14% are answering for others. Then I have another information panel here. And it's saying, um, we're going to ask a few questions about your diagnosis and then collect general information as well as opinions on a few topics, including your willingness to help advance research, as in be recontacted. Welcome to the survey. Thank you for participating. And then I get to tell them what year I was born. So I'm going to say I was born in 1956, because that's when I was born. And it's going to ask me what month I was born in. And I get to see when everybody else was born. And I get to say what day I was born. And I'm going to say I'm female. 
Now, it keeps saying selecting the best question for you. So for example, if I had said I was neither self-identified male or female, it would have given me more options. And you can see 1% of individuals have done that as well. And then the same thing with my biological sex. I'm going to say I'm female XX. But because there are quite a number of conditions that have XXY, XYY, XXYY, we actually have space for you to fill that in as well. Then the next question is going to ask me, do I want to use the US customary system or the international customary system? So inches and pounds or the metric system, as in kilograms and meters. I live in the US, and so I'm going to click this. But you can see we already have 17% of individuals using the international system. My current weight, boy, this is revealing. I'm going to put my current weight up here of 142 pounds. My current height, at least today, is 5'6". I am married, and so on. So you can start to see uh, in these even these generic questions how other people with PXE uh, stack up. By the way, this data will be removed from the survey because uh, it would skew the data since I don't have PXE, and so on. And you can also see it moves fairly quickly if I uh, click on the answer and move on. For example, I'm currently working, yes. And then I could put in my occupation or skip it. We love to have you put in as much data uh, as possible because it does give us a good picture of what people are doing, uh, whether or not later on we're going to ask you if you've lost vision, um, et cetera. Um, my birth weight, if I knew it, I actually don't. I'm just going to put that there. If you didn't know it, you can say skip or don't know. And then it asks me about my background. So now it's going to say uh, my maternal mother describes her grandmother, my maternal grandmother describes her ancestors as, and then I get to choose from this very long list of um, various countries, so in my case, French. I'm not going to continue here, but you can see that it's pretty easy to go through this survey. I can also stop at any time. Uh, it'll save where I am. I can also scroll back and look at some of my questions. But if I wanted to look at all of my questions, uh, then I would go under Health Survey here and say Update My Answers. So now I will be given a screen with my answers. And let's say that by mistake uh, I had put uh, that I was born in November, but I actually was born in um, October. I can go back now and change it. And it will ask me, do you really want to change your answer? And I'll say no so that I can find this record and delete it. Um, and so on. So under this health survey, you can either go back to answer on questions or you can update the answers you've already given. And the little pie that I saw while I was working, um, in fact, tells me, oh, you're about a quarter of the way through the question so far. The number of questions for individuals is different. And that is because uh, if I say, for example, that I have low vision, it's going to take me on a whole long, long list of questions about I. If I say I have gastro bleeds, it's going to take me on a long, long trail of, um, of uh, gastro bleed, gastro kinds of questions, and so on. And so all of this data, then, uh, after I finish, is contained in a system that releases only the data I've given permission for, for it to be released, uh, and in fact is then usable by researchers. Uh, of course, PXE International and its researchers, but also researchers in that PCOR net that I showed you, as well as the International Rare Disease Research Consortium. So the data can be used anywhere in the world by any researchers to further our understanding of the disease. And so um, this is a uh, really terrific system for collecting information to start, which is what you'll all see when you log in and do the questionnaire. And then later on, depending on what you've said for your interest in uh, being recontacted, we will be sending you research snippets. So the data might start to show us that everyone with PXE has green toenails. And so we're going to want to go back and ask everybody that question in detail so that we know what's going on there. Um, we've had tremendous discoveries uh, because of data that we've collected over the years. And this system is much more facile and will allow us to collect data more easily. The last thing I'll say before I start to answer questions, um, and uh, feel free to start typing those in. We have uh, one or two, and I'll get to those in a second. Um, the last thing I'll say is we need everybody to answer. You know, so back to that elephant or to New York City's view of the world, 
if we stick with just a small subset of people, we're going to get the wrong answer. We're going to think the elephant is a rope or a fan. We need the whole picture. And so we intend to uh, first blast this out, which we've done on Facebook, in the PXE chat, listserv. Um, everybody affected should have gotten an email um, uh, mail merge from me. Um, you will get, if you live in the United States or Canada, or actually anywhere in the world, you will get either a postcard or a letter from us next week. We will start mailing those out. And then following that, we're going to start phone calling. So you could imagine that you could save PXE International a lot of resources if you actually answer the survey uh, as quickly as you can on your own. If you don't, then we will be um, calling you to make sure that you can do it. We'll be glad to help you do it. We'll be glad to help you set up email addresses, whatever you need to get it done. We're also looking for volunteers. The volunteers will first do phone chains. So we'll give somebody you know, 10 names of people with PXE in your country or your state uh, or your region and have you phone them up and ask them to answer the survey. Uh, we also are looking for navigators. Navigators are people who will do what I just showed you, so essentially sit on the phone probably with someone whose vision is too low or too bad to do this, or perhaps they're uh, too old to be comfortable with the computer, um, and you will be navigating with them through the survey. That obviously is a major commitment. It will take one to two hours, probably more toward the two hours, because I could imagine uh, that you will be hearing some of their stories. So. Um, that ends my formal presentation, uh, but we do want you to ask questions now. Uh, we're not closed to questions after this webinar. We're happy to answer them any time. Uh, primarily, Chris Vokey will be your contact for, um, for questions, and Chris will give you her email address. C. Vokey, C. V. Like Victor, O. C. K. E. at pxe.org. You can find any of us pretty easily. OK, so again, feel free to type your questions in the uh, question box. Uh, so the first question is, uh, so the guides are uh, like preset privacy templates from people whose story we identify with. Yes, so uh, that is absolutely true. Um, what you see when you go to the home page and look at those guides um, are three people. Eventually, in the future, we certainly could have more guides, but this was um, the um, uh, the, the uh, uh, sorry, because I'm signed in, I'm seeing uh, this. Um, these are people who we initially contacted, and they did give us stories that uh, we hope um, that you can associate yourself with. So um, you, again, can customize those, uh, and you can um, make them as personalized as you wish. Next question. Ah, OK, a question about the columns. And for that, I'm going to actually go to the uh, slide deck, because it's easier to show the columns on the slide deck. OK, so the columns, um, the columns are three. And what we mean by the columns, I'm just going to make this bigger so that you can, no, I can't do that on the PowerPoint, sorry. Uh, so this first column says, discover and view my anonymous information. And that means that uh, that's pretty typical of what most studies do. Most studies actually discover and view your anonymous information all the time. So if you go to the pharmacy today and fill a prescription, that pharmaceutical data is shared without your name and without identifying information. So it, it is anonymous information that's shared, whether you've had a surgery, whether you've been to the physician, that data is used usually. We are actually saying we're not going to actually use your anonymous data unless you allow it, or you could write Ask Me. And the reason we're doing that is we're giving everyone permissions, uh, possibilities of setting their own uh, permissions. The next column, Export and Use. This means, so I'm going to walk through this in a kind of PXE perspective. I'll get a researcher this afternoon who will say, uh, within 600 kilometers of Paris, uh, are there enough people with angioid streaks for me to do a study? So we can look in the data for anyone who said discover and view my anonymous data and see uh, we have 843 people with your specifications. That means that those people uh, can be discovered. They allowed discovery. There may be some who didn't allow it, and I won't be able to see them, or there will be some who said ask me, and I will actually have to ask them if I can share uh, any information about them. The next column, export and use. So if then, 
the researcher said, uh, I would like to compare angioid streaks with BMI, with, uh, with body mass index. Can you give me that information? I could export and use that information for anyone who had said allow for researchers, and I have to figure out whether the researcher is studying uh, PXE or uh, studying another condition, um, and only could I use the people who have said allow. Some people might have said ask me, and then I have to ask them, and some people may have said deny, and then I won't even see them. And the final column is contact. If those researchers said, we want to recruit people into a study to come to blah, blah university in Paris, then I have to find people who have said allow my contact information to be given to researchers. Or ask me, and I have to ask them. Let's see what our next question is. Um, Next question is, uh, how quickly does the email come? The email comes instantaneously, as you saw in my presentation. Um, it used to take about uh, two seconds. Now it takes less than one second. So if you haven't received the email, uh, let me see what it looks like in my email. Oops, I don't want to leave the ribbon on. Let's see, in my email, it says private access confirmation code as the subject. Um, and I guess that's pretty much, oh, and then, I, then I'll get a registration. So it said Dear Sharon Demo, because that's how I registered. Uh, and then this, uh, the, the sender is no reply at privateaccess.com. So uh, I guess look again. If not, uh, what we're offering is uh, screen sharing and technical assistance to, uh, to you if you can't find it. Another question, how can I update an answer? Very good. Uh, so I'm here. I want to say update my answers. And let me just show that again. I'm looking under here on health survey, update my answers. And then I go in here and I see all my answers. So for example, I said, that my paternal grandmother described herself or her ancestors as Azerbaijani. Bajani. That is not correct. And so I'm going to say my paternal grandmother described herself as, well, I can't find English in this list. Oh, that must be under UK. I'm going to say Ethiopian. <laughs> and so I just changed my answer. So I'm going to say, yes, I want to change that answer. And now it says my paternal grandmother described herself as Ethiopian. So I'm able to change those answers just by clicking on it. My marital status is, and I could change my mar marital status if I wished. OK, show how to make another health profile for a non-decisionally impaired person. OK, so here I am in my survey cooking along, doing fine, and maybe one of you decides you want to be a navigator. I hope that's what the question means. Um, and so as a navigator, um, I will say that I want to set up um, a health profile for someone else. So I'm going to click on health profiles at the top. And uh, over here on the right-hand side, it's going to say add another person. And so I click that. And then I'm going to say, this person, and the request was for someone non-decisionally impaired. Uh, I'm going to say someone else, because actually it's a person that I'm going to be a navigator for. And the person is a he, and their first name, let's just say, is David. And David was born, let's say, 1973, and he's living. And then I say, I certify I have the legal right to enter information about this person. Uh, we are aware that we're asking um, you, and it's actually written here as well, and it's also in the terms of service, uh, to make a statement here that we're relying on your um, uh, good truth-telling. Um, in the future, we actually are going to have the potential to upload the right documents, that sort of stuff. But for now, this is where we are. I'm going to save and continue. And now what I'll be seeing is this person is someone else, this David. Uh, David, I would say, if I was on the phone with David, do you want to set your privacy settings based on mine? I would suggest not. We don't really know each other very well, and uh, you don't really know me much. So let's set them based on the guide recommendation, or let's set them manually. 
Um, setting them manually is uh, onerous, but maybe David wants to do that. Setting them based on the guide recommendations, which I just clicked, I'm back to the guides. And so again, I could use any of these stories. I'll say, um, wow, David, you're actually pretty close in age to Dean Patterson. Um, he's an HR and uh, independent performance consultant, which sounds a lot like your work. So do you want to see more about Dean? Uh, he may say yes. Uh, I might say, do you want to hear um, what Dean My has name to is say? Dean Patterson, and I'm a patient with PXE, pseudoxanthoma elasticum. I've known about this condition for 19 years. Getting a, a great deal of participation for the research project, uh, it's going to help in several ways. Uh, first of all, I think we all feel better when we're acting on uh, a solution, when we're taking steps to, to uh, make a difference in our own condition. Uh, it'll help us all be better educated about what we're feeling. It'll give us a platform to communicate what we're feeling and how we're, we're being affected by the symptoms. But it's also going to give us um, just a straight line to some of the, uh, the discoveries and the, the research opportunities that allow us not only to be part of it, but also to benefit from it as well. And so, and so you see, uh, then I could set that guide up for, for uh, David, and I could go on to the questions. Uh, if I have a minor child, um, the, the process is very much the same. So I go back again to these health profiles. And you can see now in my account, I have myself and I have David. Um, I would recommend if you're doing this for someone else as a navigator, you not put David in your account. Uh, you actually will be setting up a separate account with David. We're going to help you do those things. So let's say David is visually impaired. He can't see his email and he can't get that code. We will set that part up for him and give you that password uh, with him to help him. But I'm now going to add another person. This person is my adult child, let's say. Uh, his name is Andrew. And <clears throat> Andrew was born in 1987. He's alive. And I have the legal right to enter information, uh, save, and continue. And again, it's essentially the same process. Um, I will be able to say I want to set him up based on me, based on the guides, or based manually. Now, if he is my adult child and I've taken care of him all these years, I probably would set him up based on my settings. And so instead of getting the three guides, um, essentially we'll go straight to putting Andrew in. And you see they gave Andrew the last name Demo, and they have him living in the same city as me. And they're using my email address to contact him. So. Uh, that instance uh, creates a sub-account of mine uh, so that then I can take care of Andrew's account since he is a decisionally impaired adult or a minor or uh, a person who needs my help. And you can see his health survey is 0% complete because he hasn't taken it yet. What other questions do people have? I'm hoping that means it looks pretty straightforward. It's moderately complex because we want to be sure that we're ensuring people's privacy. And there's a lot of questions because we want to be sure we're getting a good picture of PXE. But again, you can um, simply sign out mm -hmm. and then come back anytime you want. Here I'm showing answer health survey. I may want to go back to myself and start answering questions where I left off. It's retrieving my health profile. Sometimes this server takes a little while, particularly if I have a lot of information in there. Now I have three accounts plus the questions I've already answered. And so that may take it a while. And then when I'm back to this screen, you are currently entering information for Sharon. And then I can go to this health survey button, and I can say, answer questions. Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, we are record recording this so that you can um, listen to it anytime you want to. Again, we, um, yes, you will. Um, thanks for the um, uh, a question someone just asked, and I was reading your mind. Uh, the, the session is recorded. Uh, we do archive them. Terry will send out a notice when it's archived so that people can look at it anytime they want to. Um, and uh, tech support, uh, everything, either you can use the tech support that's built into the system, or you can simply email me, sterry at pxc.org, or chris cboki at pxc.org. 
Um, and uh, what we'll do is uh, do screen sharing with you and walk through any issues. Um, we have about 10,000 people on the system, so we know it works. Uh, there is undoubtedly browser compatibility problems and all sorts of stuff uh, that we're still working through, but we're, um, we're working on it. And right now we recommend that you use your computer. So laptop, desktop, tower, whatever. Uh, it does not work well on an iPad or an iPhone or an Android yet. Uh, we are applying for a grant to do that, but it's about a million dollars. So uh, we're working hard on getting that because we know lots of people uh, would like um, to be able to do that sort of on the fly. And particularly when we get to what we're calling research snippets that come to you once a month or once a quarter, you decide how often. Uh, we'd love to have you be able to answer those right on your phone. All right. Uh, thank you all for attending all the way from Australia, Europe, uh, the west coast of the U.S., um, and, and other countries. So we're really delighted uh, to have you. Uh, and again, don't hesitate at all to ask us questions. We really want this to work, and every question you ask makes it better for everybody. Thank you all, and have a good day. <laughs>